Hear the words of the Collect for the Twelfth Sunday after Trinity. Almighty and everlasting God, who art always more ready to hear than we to pray, and art wont to give more than either we desire or deserve, pour down upon us the abundance of thy mercy, forgiving us those things whereof our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask, but through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. We pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. The collect for today starts out with an interesting dichotomy when it says, Almighty and everlasting God, who art always more ready to hear than we to pray, and art wont to give more than either we desire or deserve. And the dichotomy comes when we begin to examine the words desire and deserve. So let's look at each of these little ideas a little bit more, shall we? Not that you have much choice, because I'm speaking and you're sitting. Anyway. <laughs> when we consider what we desire of God, if your prayers are anything like mine, then we present God with this long litany of desires, either for ourselves or for others. Even when we look at the intentions of the Mass, we see that we present people for healing and, and then for special needs, and we then pray for God to bless those who are having birthdays and anniversaries, and then we add the intention for God to remember all of those who have gone before us in the faith. All before we ever get to the intention of the Mass that we're praying for today. As I said, we have this long litany of desires that we want before we actually get to the intention of what it is that we're doing. Now, it is so very true that our humans, human desires and wants seem to be never-ending. For as soon as we receive one answered prayer, we immediately add two or three more onto the list. Part of this has to do with the very nature of our human needs and the nature of the world. We need air to breathe every moment of every day. We need food and water on a consistent basis just to survive and shelter from the elements. We also know that because of our fallen human nature that we are not immortal and that from time to time either we or those that we love will become ill and fall prey to the things of this world and need our prayers. In all of these things, we turn to God and ask him to provide for his good things of this world and for our survival, as well as for our protection from bad things of this world and from evil. And Lord, we do thank you again for protecting us from the hurricane. We thank you so much. Now, our turning to God, we call prayer. And we also know that if we truly expect God to hear us, then two things must happen first. The first is that we must believe in him and that he exists. And sorry, it's not like praying for fairies or something like that anyway. And then the second thing is, is that we must endeavor to obey to the best of our ability his commandments. It is as we seek to do this that we have the opportunity to get things very, very wrong. And this error can occur when we begin to look at the idea and to discuss what it is that we deserve from God. Now Paul brings this possible error to our attention when he writes in 2 Corinthians 3 and 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. The Apostle goes on to talk about how the law of God condemns us because of our inability to obey every jot and every tittle of it, and how it is the grace of God that saves us from its penalty. <clears throat> The possible error that we can fall into is when we believe that just because we obey most of God's law, most of the time, that we are indeed righteous. But unfortunately, we are not. 
We are righteous and good only so much as we partake of that grace which God extends to us along with His righteousness and goodness. In and of ourselves, at best, at the absolute best, we are neutral, neither good nor bad. Unfortunately, our desires, our actions, and our words soon prove to us that we are much better at the latter than we are the former. And since indeed we are not perfect in our obedience to the law, we find that the words that St. Paul wrote apply to us. As he wrote in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, for the letter kill it. And then goes on to tell us, but the Spirit giveth life. Now I have pointed out before, and I will point it out here again, what the word but does. See, when you put the word but between two ideas, the first idea is totally forgotten, and only the second remains. So if you say, for example, that, well, he is a good man, but he beats his wife. The only thing you remember is that he beats his wife. The fact that he had anything else to do which good is lost. It's the same here. It is in this spirit that Paul uses the word but in this sentence. We can see then at what he writes when he continues in 2 Corinthians 3.9. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Our sufficiency, to use Paul's word, is of God and His grace. It is not of ourselves. If we think that our obedience, as good or bad as it is, to the law of God, places God under any obligation to forgive us, <laughs> we are deadly wrong. We must understand that God is the absolute judge, and if we are not absolutely perfect every moment of every day in our obedience to every jot and tittle of the law, then we know what we deserve. And as I have said before, and will say again, I know what I deserve, and I want no part of it. Thank you very much. Since we have such a dependence on God's grace, as well as the knowledge that He freely gives us this grace, in spite of our disobedience, I wonder if I should tell you what Christ said to the man that he healed, who was blind and uh, was mute and deaf, and which is recorded in our gospel lesson today. I wonder if I should do that. I wonder what would happen. Well, let's see what Christ said. It's recorded in Mark chapter 7, verses 34 to 36. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said unto him, Ephrathah, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. And he charged them that they should tell no man. But the more he charged them so much, the more a great deal they published. So I wonder if I should tell you the same thing. Don't tell anybody anything. Be quiet. Shut up. Sit down. Let everybody else go to hell. Are you going to do what this guy did? Are you going to go out and tell people about the grace of God and what he has done in your life? Look, I can talk all day about what God's done for me. You've heard a lot of it. What has he done for you? He's given you grace. We talked today in our class about Teresa of Lourdes, the way of the little flower. She called it the little way. And what was that little way? Showing love to every person that she met. She wasn't worried about world peace. She wasn't worried about politics. She wasn't worried about anything. She was only worried about showing God's love to the person that was in front of her. No one else. That person. So I tell you, don't tell anyone. Keep it to yourselves. So maybe you too will go out and broadcast what God has done for you 
do it far and wide, but only to the person standing in front of you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.